Good morning, Liam. Good morning, Frank. Good to, good to speak to you. Hey, thanks for making the time to talk to me. Uh, so briefly, I'll, I'll introduce you. You, Liam O'Hare, you're a journalist uh, and independent filmmaker. You've uh, you've been to Palestine quite a few times in the last few years. Uh, if I'm correct, you live in Glasgow in Scotland. Yeah, well, I'm at, I'm between Glasgow and London, Frank. All right, all right. Glasgow and London, but um, but yeah, I'm I'm in I'm in Glasgow very often. Yeah, and and I wanted to talk to you. I mean, we've known each other. Or we've been in touch for I, I don't know a few years for sure, and um, and um, a few days ago. I'm lost, uh, sorry, with, with like days and stuff now. Um, uh, on Wednesday 25th, um, there was a, a Champions League game between Celtic Glasgow, which I guess is your club, and, and Atletico Madrid. And, um, and we've, I mean, the, we've seen videos and, and photos of, um, you know, some kind of solidarity action taking place in support of 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 Palestine and and Gaza, and um, and this video was I mean I think went viral I mean many videos went viral but this video because I mean I I showed it like when I got it I think our common friend Paul Laverty sent it to me uh, on WhatsApp I woke up I saw it I I shared it with a lot of lots of my friends and a few Palestinian friends were like Frank I'm crying watching this video this is so beautiful and stuff. And um, anyway, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to show the video, and then uh, and then and then you can. I'll, I'll shut up. I'll shut up, and you can answer. Um. <laughs> Looking at it again, it, 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 it still like, gives me sort of goosebumps. And um, so I wanted to talk to you about it. Like what's, because um, I, I know like football clubs right now do not like, I mean, in general, do not like political statements and stuff. Um, and, and I know that this action was against club policies. But I mean, you, you were there. Um, first, like, how did you feel when it happened? Can you also tell us, what was the song? I mean, I know it, but like for people to understand, and uh, and what what did what did it mean for you? You know that you know Palestinians. You've been there many times. So what did it mean? You know. Yeah, I think I think I think first off, that's like to be to be in the stadium when you see that is obviously a. It felt like a powerful moment, um, and it felt like a moment that that was that was sending a very strong united message um from beyond glasgow and to to the people of of palestine and in particular gaza at the moment um as as they're facing i think a, 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 an onslaught and, and a horror that, that is almost unimaginable um for us um i think the important thing with 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 celtic is to understand this isn't the first time that there has been a, a level of of solidarity and a show of solidarity with the palestinians this is something that has run through the Celtic support ever since I've known, um, ever since I've been going to games, which is from the age of, of five or six. You've always seen Palestinian flags um, at Celtic games. The Celtic support has always has consistently shown um, support for, for Palestine, in particular um, at moments like this, um, when they are when, when they are facing the, <clears throat> the brute force of, um, of the Israeli state. Um, and you're right, Frank. The, the the club the club did warn against this because um, the Green Brigade, who are um, the, the Celtic Ultras group, um, who are very active on the Palestinian issue and, and 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 have been for for many years, called for the fans to do this um, display of solidarity and 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 were also organisationally um, helping helping distribute flags etc. outside the stadium. Many people brought their own flags, but there were flags. Been distributed, so the club knew that this was planned. 
Um, and they put out a very deliberate statement to all season ticket holders. Um, very strange kind of statement. They didn't really get into the the detail of anything, but basically said, don't bring any flags related to the current um, conflict, um, as they called it. Um, the fans basically ignored this. I think, as you as you can see from the video that you just played, um, I think that all the the fans basically took it upon themselves to think there are more important things than listening to to what the club have to say. Um, the politics of the Celtic board, I think, like many football clubs, is quite removed from the wider fan base, um, and the wider fan base were determined to show um, from what little they could they could do. I think let's not also overstate it in, in, in terms of action, but I think just the act of waving a Palestinian flag, I think does, as we've seen, can go around the world at moments like this and, and can definitely make it to to Palestine, I think, where where people see that see that impact. So at the time it felt important seeing the response um from Palestine to the action, I think it feels even more important because I think anything that, that people can do at this time that says to the Palestinians, you're not alone, um, is important. And obviously that was that was the song that was being sung at the time that the display was was held up. It's often sung at the beginning of Celtic games. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of anthem of of the fan base. But I think it was even more poignant at that time to to say to the Palestinians, you'll never walk alone. Um, and, and you do have people around the world who are, who are standing with you at this time. Hey, thanks, Liam. Yeah, it's it's crucial, right? We live in a moment. And yeah, for any, anyone with a heart, and and even more so for people that know Palestinians and have been to Palestine, of 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 despair, really, right? Because uh, in a way, it, it could feel like whatever we do, um, we like you're in your whatever living room. I am in my living room, um, and and Gaza is there's a shutdown on Gaza, and it's being sort of bombed to to shred to shred. Um, but can you tell us, because you've been to Palestine many times, um, what, what do the Palestinians you know, tell you when you're there in terms of like when you're in the street in Glasgow and when the streets of London and stuff, what does it mean to them? Because a lot of people right now tell you what does, you know, what good does a demonstration do when Gaza is being bombed, you know? I, th I think that's the, that's the thing, Frank, I think. Because sometimes I think you do wonder, you know, in terms of the demonstration, does it have an impact on, on, on the leaders, you know, on, 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 a, on, on, on the governments and and where, where, where we live, and and I think it does. But I think what we definitely know has an impact, and I, you know, from from being out in Palestine, people in Palestine seeing this, the the solidarity, seeing the support, gives them encouragement, um, and and gives them hope that the and and the knowledge that they're not standing alone. Um, in times like this, and that's been uh, that's been apparent in previous displays. Celtic fans have it's not the first time Celtic fans have done big displays. There was a major one in twenty sixteen uh, when Celtic played an Israeli team, Hapoel Tel Aviv, um, and again there was all these warnings beforehand: don't do a display. Celtic are going to get fined from UEFA. Celtic fans stood up at that point and 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 said no, there are more more important things done this massive display um and once again it went it went out of Palestine um and Celtic were fined at that point um by UEFA and Celtic fans I don't know if if, if you remember Frank or some some other people watching this might that Celtic fans actually launched a fundraiser at the time called Match the Fine uh, Match the Fine for Palestine I think the fine was about 30 grand uh, 30,000 pounds um Celtic fans ended up raising raising nearly 200,000 pounds um and said we're not going to pay the fine. We're going to match it. We're going to match it multiple times over, and we're going to send that money straight to Palestine. Um, and that that since then, that's that's led to a really sort of tangible link up and, and, and solidarity. So I think moments like this, um, it's important, and and you see people like the Celtic support and other people redoubling their efforts um, to stand with Palestine, especially um, despite any sort of warnings or penalty. That, that obviously, I think. Um, as as people who have been familiar with the Palestinian issue for some time are all aware of all of the all of the kind of warnings and threats etc that can, that can come in this environment. Yeah, because I mean we live in a moment. I mean you you've talked about it where civil disobedience is in a way even more so for us with our European white privilege. 
is a duty, right? It's not even a question now. And and I'm feeling it also like in Brussels, that's where I live, where people are ready to take action that they know uh, could could lead to legal issues and stuff. But they were like, because we have to remember, right, that Gaza is being bombed by Israel with the total support pretty much of Western, you know, states. Uh, so we are all Scots, French, Belgians, Italians, one way or another, even if we don't agree with it, involved with this fucking massacre, right? Without 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 a doubt, without a doubt, you know, you 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 look at the you know UN resolution the other day, you look at the the, the countries who voted against and then abstained in it. Um you look at where the weapons are coming from, do you know what I mean? Um and they are being supplied by you know European states and, and by the United States. Um you look at the fact it's quite incredible Frank is here in you know here here in England, I'm not sure it's exactly the situation in Belgium. I, I imagine it's quite similar, but both um both the ruling Conservative Party and the opposition Labour Party, neither of whom are calling for a ceasefire just now. So you've got a consensus within the British political establishment and elite of the two main parties. Um, neither of whom are, are even have the guts to call for a ceasefire. You know what I mean? In this in this context where it's apparent you know the the urgency is so apparent. Like we, I, we are, and I know you, you know this, and probably all the viewers know this. But we're, what we're looking at in Gaza, I think, is horror beyond imagination. Um, so at a time like this, I think the onus is on everybody to take action where and how they can to raise their voice um, to ensure that Palestinians are not alone, and to ensure that the pressure is put on in any in any situation you can. And I think the the power of of global solid solidarity and the global solidarity movement is that you can put pressure locally and hope and that can have an impact and that can all build up incrementally um to hopefully having a significant impact on on things on the ground. Um so the urgency has never been more important, Frank, I think as as we both know. Um but I think what we're seeing in terms of the demonstrations, I'm sitting in London, there's a demonstration later on today, I think I expect there'll be hundreds of thousands of people um on the street once again. I think the level of activism is being ramped up. People are raising their voices, um, you know, and I think that's that that that's the important thing that people know that they they can do, and and it's important for people not to just be sitting around and feeling hopeless by the situation because that's also very easy, you know. It's also very easy, and I think we're all feeling um, quite raw by what's going on at the minute. Um, every t- every time you turn on your TV screens, but I think yeah, obviously we need to understand as well that we're not the ones who the bombs are dropping on and we do have the ability to to do things and to be active um and to raise voices where possible so um and i think we're seeing that so i think that 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 will ramp up and and the action at celtic was just one symbol of that but i think around the world we're seeing people raise their voices hey thanks liam Uh, i've got another question for you and in a way i wasn't sure we're going to talk about this but I mean, I want to, because you're a journalist, um, yeah. I mean, you know, I know you know what I'm going to say is is right, but people don't understand it. To be, for Israel to be able to raise Gaza to the ground, the, the step before has to be a massive level of propaganda, right? And for anyone who's followed Israel and the way they work and the way, I mean, the US work and the way France works when they want to go to war. Um, I remember actually reading Chomsky uh, about the Second World War. And he was saying, you have to remember that at the time, the US population was very peaceful. You know, they're very for peace, not, you know. But to make sure the US went to war with their support, there was massive propaganda. And he, Chomsky said maybe it's the first major propaganda campaign in history to turn these quite you know peaceful people into like a warmonger country where we seeing where we've seen the last two weeks starting with the events of october 7th that in a way and we have to say it we have to repeat it we have to to have the balls in a way to do it because we don't know a lot about what happened on october 7th we don't. I mean, Biden apparently saw pictures of 
baby decapitated. It, it's proven to be false. Um, woman raped on top of their dead husband. You know, there's a lot of stuff that might have happened, but right now, as journalists, there's no primary evidence that they did. I don't know if you saw a report from Haaretz a few days ago. They've identified so far, and maybe I'm late now, but at the time, they've identified 683 bodies of dead Israelis. They know who they are, they know where they live, they know their fathers, they know their hobbies, they know... Out of 683, I think 48% are soldiers. So pretty much 50% are soldiers. So the claim repeated over and over and over and over again that, and actually it was like 1,200, then it went to 1,300, now it's 1,400. And I heard Peace Morgan yesterday say like, oh, 1,500 innocent Israelis were massacred by Hamas. 1,500 is bullshit. Let, let you know, even Haaretz and, and the IDF says it's like 1,300. But then it's not 1,300 innocent civilians. We have to make it clear. If 50% are soldiers, a soldier in times of war is not an innocent civilian. Then there's another report saying from the kibbutz, from people living in the kibbutz, you know, like Hamas killed people, but then the IDF came and started to bomb fucking the kibbutz all over and killed civilians. So there's a lot of gray facts. But the fact that Hamas is now being portrayed as ISIS, which is also so ridiculous when anyone knows anything about ISIS or Hamas, is part of people saying they're monsters, let's bomb them to pieces. Sorry, I was long there. But what is the role of propaganda now? And how can we help people see through it? Because sorry, I'm going to end with this. But I remember I was part of the media team of the Free Gaza flotilla, you know, when the flotilla and stuff. The first thing Israel did when they came on the boats, they confiscated every camera, mobile phones, everything. Because if you if you manage to claim the media narrative for the first 48 hours and you bombard the world with lies, even if like a week later, let's see, we share in Abu Akhle, you know, a week later, it's like, no, actually, it was you guys who did it. And like, yeah, we did it. People forgot, and it's too late, and the massacre happened. Sorry, I, I went on and on, but what, what's your what's your take? Exactly, I think you raise a lot of a lot of important points there, Frank. I think evidently, you know, when when, when we're discussing the the seventh of October, I think knowing the facts of everything that happened, I think will take some time, if ever, to be honest. Um, knowing the full the full picture, obviously. You know, in, in certain instances, when you saw, for instance, the uh, the houses which had which were looked to have been demolished, um, I think initially when I saw those pictures, you kind of wondered what what happened there because the houses you, you saw the remnants of houses, and then obviously it since transpired that a lot of houses were shelled um, by the Israeli army um, with the with, with the hostages still inside them, along alongside the the Hamas fighters as well. So I think evidently there is a lot to come out about that. Um, and as well in terms of the the attack that we're seeing in Gaza just now about specific incidents. Um, of course, the Israeli army is pumping out propaganda. And I think in a lot of cases, all they need to do is cast doubt on things. And very often that doubt is enough to take the sting out of any kind of movement, any kind of movement towards accountability, any kind of movement, indeed as well towards a ceasefire because of the horror of some of these actions. So the Israelis often, and this, and this is their playbook in, in many instances, the Israelis don't need to prove that they didn't do something. All they need to do and all they attempt to do is cast some doubt, is raise a flag that says, Hang on, maybe there's other factors. But some, some, sometimes that evidence is is is, is fabricated completely, um, as 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 I think we can see in some of the tapes that they are releasing um, with re, with regard to supposed Hamas fighters speaking to each other. They've done that in the in the case of the 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 hospital that was bombed. They've done that now again in the case of the hospital um, Al Shifa Hospital, where they are saying. Hamas headquarters on underground, underground. It seems to be a pattern in terms of hospitals, in terms of justifying 
potential attacks on hospitals come alongside these tapes, which many experts have said are completely fabricated. So there is no doubt a propaganda war going on just now. There is no doubt there is fabrications of intelligence, of evidence. And there is also no doubt that this supposed evidence has very often been swallowed up by the media and taken as fact um, and been reported as fact. And we've seen where this leads us, you know, we've, we've seen this playbook before um, where you depend on intelligence to, to make a case for war. You don't need to look back very far, you know, until the Iraq war, obviously, um, the intelligence um, the intelligence attempts at that time um, were very apparent. So what we are seeing is nothing new, um, but I think it is, it, it's incredibly dangerous. Um, and, and I think everybody, in terms of how we deal with this, I think everything needs to be critiqued, everything needs to be analysed, and the media obviously have a hugely important role to play here in terms of not taking what Israel says at face value, because they've been proven time and time again to fabricate evidence, they've been proven to lie about what they're doing, and especially in a moment that's so critical as this, I really don't, I, you, you can't really take anything as fact that the Israeli army is saying at this point, because what they're trying to do is to justify actions which are beyond human comprehension. Um, so if they are willing to bomb churches, bomb hospitals, massacre people in huge numbers, then you can bet your bottom dollar they're willing to lie about it as well. So that has to be remembered at all times. Hey, thanks, mate. I mean, we could go on and on, um, um, but we're gonna. I'm gonna end it here. I, I just uh, another thing, like um, I want to do an interview actually, and I'm I'm looking at people that have worked um, and covered and researched extensi extensively the um, extensively, yeah, extensively the um, the pattern of Israel, you know, since two thousand two thousand and six, targeting hospitals, medical facilities ambulances. I mean, I spoke to John Dugard, former UN envoy to Palestine a few days ago, and he was behind the report, uh, Operation Cast Lead report for the um, Arab, Arab League of Nations. He told me, yeah, obviously, I mean, during Cast Lead, um, uh, Israel targeted, I don't have the right number in my head now, but between like 15 and 20 hospitals, Israel targeted about 30 mosques, Israel targeted about 22 schools. So it's nothing new, you know, it's nothing new. But I mean, yeah. people tend to think of history as yesterday, right? And um, but anyway, um, yeah, yeah, no, it's um, it's 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 it's, it's a pattern of behavior, isn't it? It's a pattern of behavior. Um, if you follow their actions, then um, for some time in any of these wars, we've all seen it before. What's it's it's, it's sometimes just still quite incredible seeing how it's swallowed up by people who should know better. Do you know what I mean? People who should know better and people whose job it is to know better than to believe every claim that's coming. Um, and I think all, all we can do is, as, as, as journalists, um, all, all, all people can do as activists is to, is to raise their voices um, higher and to analyse everything that comes out of the Israeli state just now. Thanks, mate. Much appreciated.